Hi, my name's Tony, and I'm a brony. I'm not ashamed to say it. You know, society kind of hates us. Every day I go out walking wearing my derpiest best pony t-shirt. People throw stuff, they throw food, they throw all kinds of stuff. You know, I think that's unfair. This fandom has really helped me get out of my shell. You know, I've gone to some pretty cool places, I've met some pretty cool people. Especially her. <laughs> Bronies, the extremely unexpected adult fans of My Little Pony, leaves me very torn. Ambivalent, you could say. People are right to pick it apart, but I've never seen anybody cover it from the perspective of someone who saw this when they were a kid. This was one of my first exposures to the fandom, and it had me thinking being a brony was the coolest thing ever. Not even joking, this is brony propaganda. Either targeted to make you feel good for liking this pony show, or to show your parents and have them be like, Oh, so it's like, a whole thing? That's nice, dear. Brony. My the driving force behind this thing is John Delancey, best known for playing Q on Star Trek TNG, and more importantly, for voicing Discord in My Little Pony. John says it himself in this thing, he thought it was a one-and-done cameo in a little kid's cartoon until he found out the bronies were a thing, and that they loved his character specifically. And he's been to many a Star Trek convention, so he knows how the gig works at this point. I'm actually gonna give John the benefit of the doubt and say that the doc wasn't solely made to wring money out of dedicated fans. In the announcement, he says that he was trying to create something to counter all the negative press bronies were getting. This phenomenon of brony conventions clearly was foretold in the Book of Revelation. This and I want to think that was part of it, but the film that came out clearly panders to bronies themselves, with barely any self-awareness. You would expect a documentary like this about some niche subculture to maybe approach it from an outsider perspective, to try and understand why bronies dedicate themselves to this sh little kid show, maybe debunk some of the common myths about the community, or show some strong counter-arguments to those. Anytime the film tries to do something like that, it comes off as either confusing or highly unconvincing. I'm sorry, parts of this feel like a parody. The Alcoholics Anonymous intro with the blue background and these green screen interviews. I don't know why half of these people are qualified to talk about this. And don't get me started on the so-called brony psychologists. We are post 9-11 worrying about terrorism. If you're what? If you're watching this barely knowing anything about bronies, or with any kind of critical eye, or heaven forbid, you might have some negative preconceptions about them, you're gonna laugh and you're gonna see right through what they're doing. Through all the people we see and what we're told, My Little Pony and being a brony is the most important thing in the world. It's not, these people are just another fandom like comic books or Star Trek. No, it makes it sound cult-like, it really does. And that's not to say that fandom can't bring people together, or that media can't have a positive influence on people at all. If anything, I think the community aspect is something that you can hold up as a defense of the fanbase. But, MLP is treated as this gift from God that lifts people up and teaches them important lessons about how to coexist with each other and brings millions of sad, lonely men out of their shells who would otherwise have no outlet. And if you don't like it, buddy, then you might just need to take a second look. And you're not gonna win people over by just saying that because that's not how the world works. Well, <laughs> to we the normies enormous. at least. And this ain't for them. It can't say anything critical because it needs to congratulate bronies for waking up every morning and breathing air. How else could they have raised $300,000 on Kickstarter? Even back then, before the fandom was overrun with oddly sultry art of the ponies with mother-bearing hips, clopping still existed. There's no mention of it beyond the clopping. Nope, nope, you gotta explain what that is. Mom and dad are in the room watching this with you. Why do you make that face? Why do they animate the Terra Strong pony like that? Cover up, you! And when they don't bring up the flaws in the fandom, that or any kind of drama or possible negatives, it leaves the viewer to make all those things up themselves. If I feel like I'm being lied to or sold something and they're not giving me the fine print, my brain is gonna be like, okay, what's really going on here? And that little thing, that little cognitive function is gonna make people assume the worst. And I get you could make the argument that it is to show outsiders that bronies are normal. There are a lot of parts that look like that, but to me they came off more trying to seem relatable or self-aggrandizing. That's your vocab word for this video, self-aggrandizing. When they bring in the military bronies, or Dusty Cat, or any of the people they interview over the age of 15, it's saying to me, look at how cool and misunderstood we are, not look at how cool and misunderstood these people are. As soon as the first cut of the doc was released, there was a big problem with piracy, and it caused a lot of hiccups with the official distribution, including a bunch of pieces being cut out or unfinished. Thanks, guys. But like a racehorse, the doc was flying out the gate into the public eye. What did people think? 
bronies liked it. And I will say, if you are a brony, or were at that time, this is a treat. The production value is relatively high, and they go around the world to a few different places. It's a very big, sweeping look, and thinking about this from the angle of being an MLP fan, it does do its job. I want to go to BronyCon now. I think I've pointed out that this thing is biased before, but a lot of reviews point out some other weird bits about it. Little suspicious loose ends, like, hmm, Tug's little... what's this? Oh, homophobia. I'm gonna try my best not to parrot the Jenny Nicholson video when I talk about this, but yeah, it's no secret. These people do not want to be called gay. Oh, you like a little girl show? Oh, well, you know, you must be, you know, feminine and, or gay or whatever. You're gonna suddenly turn gay. Are you gonna catch the gay by watching the show? I think I asked if they were gay. Suddenly, maybe you're homosexual and then it's a reason to hate you. He might be thinking that I'm gay. That, in fact, they are a highly educated group of heterosexual male. Like, being gay is apparently the worst thing in the world. And I understand that getting labeled as something you aren't in any capacity is annoying, but the way they talk about it though defensively here is slightly hypocritical. Like, we like a little girl show, but we're not a homosexual. We're not deviants. There's also a big issue in how the film leaves out a lot of the female fans. An article from BTC btchflix.com points out the ratio of male to female fans interviewed and how one of the only ones featured is there because her boyfriend is a brony. They also mentioned that yeah, it is an adult male phenomenon, but since this is a traditionally girl-oriented property, it would be nice to explore the whole brony thing from that perspective. But you know, there are things I liked about it. It brings a tear to the old eye whenever they interview someone who's an artist who just makes stuff about a show they like. There's this really great bit on the official Brony Doc Team YouTube channel about this guy who draws pony art, and I wish the movie had a little bit more of that. And any of the time they do show people who genuinely were helped by bronies, it gives the thing a few points. The part where Tara Strong goes and sees the kid was sweet, and I also like the part about the little British lad learning to come out of his shell. They really should have put more emphasis on that instead of cutting back to him once every 20 minutes. I also really love the little bit with the lasers, that one was one of the three things I remembered from watching this as a kid. The other being the guy who almost got shot because of his Celestia and Luna decal. His rifle. He was playfully aiming it at me like, you know, you gotta stop this pony, you little gay girly. That's so why he pointed it right at me and I freaked out. I think the animations were well done and were on par with the earlier show seasons really high quality. Them and the song, though, are probably one of the most confusing parts of this. Well, a confusing cherry on top of a confusing brony Sunday. They go into this weird thing about how, oh, there are three types of bronies, and I never in my life have heard of any delineation between moderates, hipsters, and artists. That might have been something that was thought up early on that didn't match the footage and interviews they ended up getting, or if there was the whole piracy thing that stopped production, it could have been expanded on more. Also, I won't get over how ironic it is that the Go and Meet the Brony song sounds exactly like I've Got a Little List from Gilbert and Sullivan. Here, John Delancey Pony is listing all these things that are good based on a song about how people need to get executed. Perfect, ideal, like, genius, triumphant, dramatic, artistic parallels. Mwah. I love it. Bronies 2012 is a flop in every sense. I'm sure a lot of you people's first exposure to it was in that Jenny video where she calls it a cultural artifact, and I agree, this is something Indiana Jones would be searching for. This is like when you see black and white videos about World War II. No, this is medieval found footage. There's nothing quite like it, and I kinda love it for that. As an MLP fan too, who has really specific nostalgia for that era, I see this and I wish I could've been a part of that world back then. I'm like Ariel, but you know, instead of wanting a human BF, it's wanting to jump up and down in a crowded stadium while listening to Beyond Her Garden played live. We'll be right back to the Hub Family Movie. My name is Doof, and you'll do what I say. Woo, woo. And now, we're back to the Hub Family Movie. But, you know, I still really wonder what an unbiased look at bronies could look like in a film. Well, wonder no more, because a brony tale has got you covered. 2014's A Brony Tale takes an outside perspective. Kinda. I wouldn't call the voice actress for AJ and Rainbow Dash an outsider, but we do follow someone 
who's never heard of Bronies, and their experience with the fandom. There are a lot of similarities between this and Bronies, but I want to go and say that a Brony tale is more intimate. There's still the same kind of interviews with the Brony people and all that, but there's less jumping around, and when we go to a new person, we usually focus on them for a long time and then move on. Some pretty notable Brony figures show up too. I also really liked how they were able to get a hold of people like the little high school Brony club or the SoCal Brony meetup group. It's a more diverse set of people, and they even did something more effective with their military brony they got. This guy who talks about being overseas and gets to show his drawings to the voice actors, it's pretty heartfelt. The movie really feels like an alternate version of its predecessor, and it accomplishes some of the things I was hoping from it. What's really funny is that this is the same convention that they filmed for the other doc, so you get to see it from a whole different angle. And you know who also comes back in this too? Mr. and Mrs. 9-11. And this lady says the same thing. What is her deal? He looks like the kind of person who would think that. What's both their deal? Why do, what do they have to gain from this? They have to be grifting. I'm sorry. They look like villains from some 90s kids movie. They're like the bad guys from the Tom and Jerry movie if they switch body types. John Delancey We've making bronies 2012. Money. The choice of following Ashley's journey is such a smart one. It's that classic writing technique where you have a character who doesn't know anything about the world being the audience surrogate and getting everything shown to them. Ashley is like the Luke Skywalker of the brony universe. Outsiders have someone to relate to, and you can imagine what it would be like to be in that situation. They also approach the tone and editing in a slightly different way. There are a lot of these artsy shots or montages during the transitions. You could argue it distracts from the main point, but it was more comforting than pretentious in my opinion. It lets you digest what you just heard. The one part where they try a little too hard with that was near the beginning. They have this black and white TV bit where they're like, the nature of humans, blah, blah, blah. How much of this was influenced by the Super Size Me guy, who, yes, was a producer on this thing? He's behind the camera. All right, Ashley, put your arms out. We need people to see you're a free spirit. You're a free spirit. Is a brony tale the perfect platonic version of a good brony documentary? No. It goes about it in a better way, but there's still some parts that they leave out. But if this is 2015 and you have to show your parents something to prove that you're not weird for being a brony, I would go with this. It feels like there was less of a filter going in, with less bias towards being a brony is freaking epic. Especially when they get to Ashley's bandmates, these people are mixed to negative about it. I don't care about my little pony. 30 year old dudes liking a little kid's show about female ponies, you know? Yeah, if they weren't being recorded, what do you think they'd say? Before we close out, I want to share the most jaw-dropping part of the film with you. You know that picture of the guy in the Rainbow Dash hoodie that every evil hack mainstream news article likes to use? He's from this. It's from this. Never in my life have I felt more bad for a person than I have for this guy. This man's image was sullied, I say. Sullied. thought it was over. Brony Chronicles is actually made by bronies for bronies. Led by former brony icon Saberspark, the two-part YouTube documentary goes over the history of the MLP franchise, G4, before trying to explain the brony phenomenon through commentary and interviews. I did like how they at least tried to go into earlier generations, and the stuff about the production of FIM is interesting, but it didn't really get to the point. There's a part at the end of the second episode where they explain that sci-fi and comic book fans are just like bronies, and those things are, you know, popular, normal. A great point that might have needed to come before a lot of other stuff. I like the interview portions, and there was a lot of information, but it jumps around way too much, even more than the 2012 thing. Production value also makes this feel like a relic. It reminds me of an old scare theater video, the way they'll pull random graphics, presumably from Google Images, and this is literally just me. But since I know a lot of the research from this was pulled from random websites, there's a lot of stuff I already knew. But that's because I made these. Also, all three of these have featured our friend Dusty Cat. Dude was everywhere. Bronies are an interesting bunch. And I think it's great to look at these old attempts to catalog the fandom and present it to a general audience. Like I said before, these are such time capsules. I love the footage they show of these old conventions and interviews with all these fandom titans. If you've seen any of these, hit those comments and write me what you thought about them. So if you see someone who is a brony, you know, don't question it. It's fine. They're normal like you and me. Also, we're not gay. I am not gay. I'm not gay.